since Scarface, so much action. Not since the Marx Brothers, so much comedy. Not since the seven-year itch, so much Marilyn. Look how she moves. That's just like jello on springs. Not an easy task for guys, you know, to stand or to walk uh, on high heels, you know. It's, it's, it's torture, believe me. Ask any man, ask any transvestite how long it took him to get used to that. I tell you, it's a whole different sex. And the only way that you think you can save your lives is by joining an all-girl orchestra, so about 80% of the picture you're going to be in drag. Do you want to do it? Uh, uh, but, but you're not a girl, you're a guy. Jack and I would make bets when Marilyn would get it right or wrong. You know, Marilyn would come in and have a shot, shaking her hand, saying, relax, relax. Jack would come in and say, magic time, magic time. <laughs> I, I was stuck between these two people. It was an irresistible combination. Hollywood's reigning sex symbol, a popular matinee idol, and an up-and-coming funny man, teamed with a supporting cast of the greatest names from the classic gangster films of the 1930s. Good night, honey. He was from the moon. I mean, this guy, or, or some other planet. I mean, he was crazy. Some Like It Hot was the creation of producer-director Billy Wilder and his writing partner, I.A.L. Diamond. We, we get into a room and talk, or don't talk, as the occasion <laughs> demands, until uh, something comes up. I mean, it's a, 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 a close working relationship. Do you ever, do you, do you ever uh, argue or fight about All the that? time. Do you? Sure. <laughs> cool. It's like, it's like a marriage, you know? And why would a guy want to marry a guy? Security! They came in every morning at 9 o'clock and 9.30. One of them read Variety, one of them read The Reporter, then they switched. Then they sat and stared at each other until somebody got an idea, and sometimes it, they stared at each other for three or four weeks. Before anybody sat down and wrote a word, they talked the whole picture out, so that when you hear that they wrote it as they went along, they did, in fact, to a certain degree, but they knew where they were going. We usually start with two-thirds of a script, script written down on paper. That doesn't mean the rest of it wasn't constructed. I mean, we always had the third, third act in our heads, just a question of doing a little paperwork. My brother and I uh, formed our own company. We named it the Mirish Company, and we uh, made an arrangement with United Artists for them to distribute our films. Billy came in one day and said, I've been thinking about this picture. And uh, it's about these uh, two musicians who are out of work, and the only way they can get jobs is to disguise themselves as women and get jobs in an all-girls band. What do you think? <laughs> I said, I love it. Harold Mirisch had a house on uh, Lexington Drive up in Beverly Hills, and he used to run movies on the weekends. So I go see Billy at Harold's house. He pulls me in a room. He said, I'm going to make a movie of two guys that have to dress up as women because they see a murder and they join a girls' band. I'm getting Frank Sinatra and you and Mitzi Gaynor. I said, anything you say, sir. And at that point, Billy felt that Tony could do either role, depending upon how they cast the second role. And they had the... He wanted to use, from the beginning, he wanted to use Lemon. I was in a little restaurant. Billy popped over, excused himself from his table, and, and uh, said, would you mind if I stopped and chatted with you for a moment about an idea I have? And I said, of course not. And he then plopped down, and I can't do Billy's accent. I don't think that Billy can do Billy's accent. But anyway, he more or less, in 60 seconds, said, I've got this thing, and it's, it's, it's set back in the 20s there with the St. Valentine's Day massacre, and you're going to be a musician. But another fellow who's a musician, and you witness the St. Valentine's Day, blah, 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 and so forth, and they see that you see them, and uh, you two musicians run away and hide from them, and the only way that you think you can save your lives is by joining an all-girl orchestra, so about 80% of the picture you're going to be in drag. Do you want to do it? And realizing he was stone cold sober, a light went off, and I said, yes. I don't know why to this day I said yes. Normally I'd say, where's the script? Where, where's something? I just said yes, because it was him. But the money people didn't feel that Jack was at that point a big enough star, and they wanted him to use Sinatra. So the originally planned, the original plan was Tony, Sinatra, and Mitzi Gaynor. And Billy made a date with Sinatra for lunch. 
and Sinatra stood him up. And that Maricolas took care of that. But Billy felt it would be too much trouble, and certainly setting him up for lunch was evidence of it. So then, about the same time, Marilyn called and said she wanted to work with him again. And he said, fine. And once he had Marilyn and Tony, Jack was plenty big enough. And nothing happened for a couple of months. And then I got a call. And the, uh, he was at the Golden Studios. He said, come down. I've got about the first act, as he would say, or 60 or 70 pages of it. He gave it to me. We chatted for a few minutes. I went home alone and read that thing and fell off the couch. And I knew then, boom, God had struck. You know, it, it was just one of those, those moments. Billy felt strongly about black and white because he felt that uh, since the picture itself was in period, and since we were doing something that's going to be very difficult, namely trying to make uh, our boys acceptable in, in drag, that that might work better in black and white than in color, and he persuaded us to that. Incidentally, an awful lot of people, I'm sure, because I was aware of it in the industry at the time, thought he was crazy uh, for making this film, or trying to make this film, that it would be a disaster, that you was trying to make a two-hour or feature-length farce out of a five-minute burlesque sketch. We had makeup tests which were drudgery because we went through a week of Tony and me sitting side by side. I finally realized after about four days with the bee sting lips that I was getting to look like a bad imitation of my mother. Jack always said that, that he patterned uh, the character after his mother. Uh, he fell into it very easily because he, he's sort of a living room performer, among other things. It was much harder for Tony. Tony was very self-conscious about it. But Jack, the first time you put him in high heels, he walked out there and, and was, you know, talking girl talk to the members of the crew. You know, he loved it. He was, he was having a ball. When Jack came out, he was like a 20-cent tart. He was chewing gum and yum, 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 yum. He was his hips swaying left and right, you know, carrying a purse. Not, but when I saw him, Instinctively, I understood that I, could, I was not going to do that. So I came out like Grace Kelly or my mother, always meticulous. And doing wardrobe tests, I realized we had it made. That is to say, we knew we were going to blend with each other like two good musicians. Finally, it was about the fifth day, and I said, what do you think, Tony? He says, I'm happy, and I said, so am I. Let's go show Billy. And he said, wait a minute, i got a better idea. He said... Let's go and see what, what happens. See if they catch on to us right away or, or what. And I said, OK. So we walked down to the ladies' toilet. And we went right to the mirror, started putting on our lipstick. And through the mirror, we could see the stalls behind us, girls coming in and out. I finished my lipstick. I said, you do yours? He says, yeah. I said, I told you it would work. He says, I can't believe it. I said, let's go, darling. And we walked out. And as we got to the entrance, or the exit of the ladies' room. A girl coming by said, hi, Tony. I said, hello, no. <laughs> so we went up to Billy's office, and he looked at the two of us, and he said, oh, it looks good to me. Then uh, Tony and I told him about what we, what we had done, and he said, that did it. Don't change anything. We went on location first, the back lot at uh, MGM, because they had a train station, and that's where we did all of the train stuff, getting on and off the train. That's where the Marilyn walks by and the steam blurts out behind her. I rather felt the steam was sort of a first cousin to the scene that Billy shot with her in Seven Year Itch where the air thing comes up and blows her skirt up. And that uh, he was rather trying to top himself. <laughs> when the picture started, I couldn't get the right uh, uh, elevation of my voice. I mm -hmm. kept slipping in and out and slipping out. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 there was an actor, I don't remember what his name, a very fine uh, voice actor, mm -hmm. who came in, did some dubbing. Then they combined the two, and then it ended up uh, what it was. Hello, Mr. Polyakov. I understand you're looking for a couple of girl musicians. We went down to the Coronado Hotel and started shooting there. Marilyn was in excellent shape and condition, you know. All the lines came out easy. Sugar? Here. I'll carry the instruments. 
thank you, Daphne. Oh, thank you, Daphne. Isn't she a sweetheart? Daphne, I had no idea you're such a big girl. Oh, sugar, you should have seen me before I went in a diet. Oh. I mean, your shoulders and your arms. Oh, well, I, that's from carrying that bull fiddle around all day. Oh, there's one thing I envy you for. What's that? You're so flat-chested. Clothes hang better on you than they do on me. We're shooting the beach scene when Billy said, uh, what shall we do for the millionaire? I said, I'd like to do something different. He said, what would you do? I said, well, maybe I could talk a little bit like this. He said, well, do it, Tony. I said, I shall. And where did you get that phony accent? Nobody talks like that. So I took Cary Grant and manipulated him a little bit. Syncopators. Does that mean you play that very fast music, uh, jazz? Yeah, real hot. <laughs> oh, well, I guess some like it hot. I personally prefer classical music. She was under the auspices of Paula Strasberg and Lee Strasberg. Uh, she would do a shot, and she wouldn't look at you, she'd look at Paula. And Billy caught that on very early, right in the middle of a, a scene once he said, cut. He says, how was that for you, Paula? The Coronado shoot, I thought, went quite well. We came back to the studio, and of course, uh, problems developed with Marilyn. She had ills, she had insecurities. Many, many difficulties, which uh, led to uh, multiple takes and uh, rather tried the patience of her fellow actors and most particularly uh, Billy Wilder. It was tough. It, uh, let's say the Monroe uh, thing, you know, her, her fear of the camera, her, her, her occasional lack of concentration. You know, this is, this is not cheap. Even in those days, you know, a, a day of shooting cost like $20,000, but just blown to bits. And not that she came at 9 o'clock prepared, because she would come like at uh, 11.30, and she would then say, having worked there for a long time, said, I'm sorry, I lost my way to the studio. She forgot the address of the studio. But every, every, every possible thing happened. I came down on the set one day when uh, Tony and Marilyn were shooting their love scene where he does Cary Grant and she's kissing him to see if it works. We all sat around for two hours before she would come out of her dressing room. Billy did tell both, both uh, Jack and Tony, and Tony will tell you this, that he said to them, you guys have got to be perfect on every single take because once Marilyn gets it right, that's what gets printed. The rumor was Paula Strasberg, who was on the set all the time with Marilyn, was her dark shadow, was signaling to Marilyn whenever she thought the scene was not showing Marilyn to the best advantage. And Marilyn would then stop dead in the middle of the scene. But uh, the fact that she might very well be doing it on purpose was a source of considerable irritation to everybody. Where did you learn to kiss like that? I used to sell kisses for the milk fund. When we were in the rushes and the lights went on, Tony stood up, and as he was standing up, he said, it's like kissing Hitler. Well, Jesus. I said, did he? Did he? he didn't really say that, did he? Yeah, he did. Woo. And there was a silence in the room and a deep intake of breath from Paula Strasberg. And Is came home and told me what had happened. They were all scared. They were scared that Paula would go and tell Marilyn, and Marilyn would refuse to finish the uh, film. But there wasn't anybody in the room, with the exception of Paula Strasberg, who wasn't totally in sympathy with Tony. As, as I said, he was giving the performance of his career. The joke was so obvious that it was scary that nobody got it if I said it, and I probably did. What was it like kissing Marilyn Monroe? It's like uh, uh, going down a mountain on a sled and flying to the moon on Joshua wings. What are you talking about? What's it like kissing Marilyn Monroe? I said, it's like kissing Hitler. What do you expect me to say? That was, if that's, that was the intent, don't you see? Everybody seemed to take it as a, a great insult. It was no insult to Marilyn. You know, it wasn't any insult to anybody. Everybody in the company knew what, what, what I was talking about. And after all the uh, newspaper women, what did you mean by that? Kissing was like kissing. I said, I never said it. Leave me alone. I forgot to give you a receipt.
walked onto the set, and there was Billy with these things going like this. And I said, what the hell is he doing? And then Billy saw me, he says, I... he says, here, in between every line, just go da, 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 da. I said, uh-huh, okay. He's lost it. I'm engaged. Congratulations. Who's the lucky girl? I am. <laughs> what? Osgood proposed to me. We're planning a June wedding. <laughs> what are you talking about? You can't marry Osgood. You think he's too old for me? When I saw the film and heard an audience reaction, laughing all through this, before then they never missed the next line. Will you stop treating me like a child? I'm not stupid. I know there's a problem. I'll say there is. His mother. We need her approval. But I'm not worried because I don't smoke. Uh -huh. huh? It's me, Sugar. That was that was that very famous scene where she used to come into the room. The boys were in, in women's clothes. She still thinks that they are girls. And uh, she used to enter and she used to say, where's that bourbon? She knows that the guys have bourbon. This is prohibition time. And she is so disappointed in uh, what is happening in her private life that she needs a slug of that uh, booze. And she used to come in and she used to say, to knock on the door and they say, who is it? And she used to say outside the door, it's me, sugar. She comes in and she used to say, where is that bourbon? That was it. And she had a mental block. She just could not say that line. Just a minute. Sugar, it's me. Uh, after take 16, 16, she spoiled because she knocked at the door. Who is it? Sugar, it's me. No, no, cut. And now she would burst into tears. Now we have to remake the makeup, right? We redo it, you know, because there's the mascara. And, uh, and uh, after take, like, uh, 53, I took her to the side. And I said, Marilyn, please don't worry. And she would look at me and said, worry about what? You know, she does a strange, strange girl. And then, then we said, look, look, I tell you what you do. You come, we put on the door outside, we're going to write in big letters. Knock, knock, and then say, who is it? And you would say, it's me, sugar. Just read it. And uh, finally, she comes to the room. And I said, now, you know, there is that uh, a kind of a uh, uh, piece of furniture with lots of drawers. And uh, it's in one of those drawers. Whichever drawer you open, it will be lined with the piece of paper which says, where is that bourbon? Whichever you open, you cannot, you can, well, there were another 30 takes, because she went to the wrong piece of furniture. I would have printed anything, except maybe where is that Dr. Pepper? So you just say, my God, my God, well, uh, this was a question as to who is going to have a nervous breakdown, me, the two guys who were suffering, or, or the, the, the money man, you know, we work for the marriage company, and they, they, you know, this, is, this is not cheap, even in those days, you know, a, a day of shooting costs like $20,000, but just blown to bits. But the fact of the matter is, she had her back to the camera. They could have dubbed that line at any time later on. Where's that bourbon? And it became basically a contest of wills. One of them was going to win, and it was going to be Billy. <laughs> it required a, a much longer shooting schedule than we had uh, originally planned for it. I would guess the picture was three quarters of a million dollars or so, or more over budget. I tell you, we were, we were already shooting, and uh, Is Diamond, my collaborator, and I were still fiddling around with the final scene. And uh, it was late in the evening, and uh, the, the, the scene had to go into mimeographing to be distributed. And uh, we came to the, we just said, now we need a big lab, we need something. Uh, he, uh, Lemon, in the girl's clothes, taking off his wig and trying to tell uh, uh, our beloved Joey Brown, the, the multimillionaire, uh, trying to tell him, uh, look, I'm, I'm a boy. Uh, now we needed a punchline. And it got to be so late, and then finally, Is Diamond said, uh, and so he says, uh, uh, nobody's perfect. And I said, well, and he says, look, it, it, it's getting very late, you know. We can always change that line. It's not chiseled in marble, you know. He just wrote it at home and left it with me while he took it, when he took it over to work on it with Billy. I read it, and... When he came home, he asked me what I thought, and I said I thought it was an absolutely brilliant thing, but that I thought that the 
last line was flat, weak. And he quickly disabused me of that. He says, you're absolutely wrong. And Billy agrees with you, and he's wrong too. And he said, you don't understand the whole structure of the scene. He said, everybody in the audience loves to be in on a joke. And he said, and everybody in this audience knows that Jack's last line is going to be, I'm a man, and he's going to take off his wig. And they're braced for that. They're ready for the explosion. He says, the only way you can do the other thing that audiences like, which is a surprise, is to give them the flattest possible reaction. No explosion. I'm good. I'm good to level with you. We can't get married at all. Why not? Well, in the first place, I'm not a natural blonde. Doesn't matter. I smoke. I smoke all the time. I don't care. Well, I have a terrible past. For three years now, I've been living with a saxophone player. I forgive you. I can never have children. We can adopt some. But you don't understand, Osgood. Uh, I'm a man. Well, nobody's perfect. Uh, so uh, we just we just uh, did it, and then slowly, kind of, we came to realize, hey, that was not a dummy line. That was one of the one of the good lines in the picture. And of course, it speaks to all of us. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> the first preview was an absolute disaster, uh, complete. A preview that the Bay Theater in Pacific Palisades. Nobody laughed. Nobody really got it. They weren't quite sure what it was about. You know, uh, they thought it was kind of a melodrama. And the next morning, Billy called me and said, uh, we're going to preview again this Friday in Westwood. I said, oh, I said, gee, what did you cut? And he said, 60 seconds. They cut scene they had no business cutting. When Marilyn tells me in the bathroom, she's sleeping over Beanstalk, and he uh, snores, and, and I tell her I could sleep over anybody. And so I let her take my berth, and I go sleep in her berth over Beanstalk. Jack, who's playing like he's fallen asleep, doesn't know this scene happened in the bathroom. So he tips down the steps, goes down in the hallway, climbs up on the ladder. Beanstalk could be or could not be in the way. He climbs, opens it, there I, there I am, he thinks it's Marilyn, and he straddles me. He says, Remember I told you I had a secret? Well, let me tell you the secret. I'm a man, and with that, I wake up, and I said, I ought to punch you in the mouth. The minute he turns over, it's when I slap the wig back on real quick, and I say, you wouldn't hit a girl, would you? Billy just took that one scene and took the whole scene out. The scene by itself was, was terrific. It was very good. But as Billy said, it was gilding the lily. It was one scene too much on the train in that whole sequence. That's all. And he didn't touch the rest of the film. And they previewed it the next week in Westwood. And somebody, and I don't know who it was, I give them credit, there used to be always, I guess it probably still is, when there's a studio preview, the card has always read, um, we present a major studio feature preview. Somebody had the brilliant idea to have the card read at that screening, a minor studio feature preview. And the audience was smart enough to realize, oh, it's a comedy. And they laughed from the beginning. They never stopped laughing. When it was all over, you know, in that uh, naturally I was absolutely drained. When I knew I had the final shots, and I looked at the rushes, and there were no scratches, so I knew we were in. Uh, uh, it was a kind of a, 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 uh, an exhaustion. Uh, there was a, a moment of never again. Well, all I can tell you is if, if, if Marilyn was around today, I would be on my knees. Please, let's do it again. The making of Some Like It Hot was over, but its long life was just beginning. Love by you, the diddly 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 dum, boop boop.